text for today is found in Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, a word that the Lord placed in my spirit while we were away recently. And I, I tucked it away, and as I was praying, the Lord brought it back to me. And uh, even this morning, I've been praying about today. And, uh, but Sister Marcia came, and she prayed about all the issues that we were going to pray about. So we thank God for that general prayer. Amen? I, I, I was praying this morning. The Lord gave me a litany of nine different areas, and probably we will deal with them tomorrow specifically in our noonday prayer. But... Um, the Lord confirmed that we would need to go in that direction today because of your prayers. Thank God. Thank God. Genesis chapter 45, and I'm going to read, want to read from verses 6 and 7. 6 and 7. Verse 6 is our main theme, verse, but verses 6 and 7. Let's go there. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing, no reaping. And our text, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We pray, oh God, for unction from above. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will come and interpret truth to you, to the hearts of your people. Cause, dear God, our testimonies to be uh, one of, uh, of, of, of illumination, oh God, encouragement, and, inc and uh, that you will uplift your people through your truth today. Thy word is truth. Lord, I hide me, Lord God, behind your veil this morning and cause your word to be elevated and promoted. Cause the hearts of your people, Lord, to be lifted, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone says... Amen. You may be seated. My subject today is the course of Percy. Sorry, preservation. The course of preservation. Yeah. And we are seeing Lady Cheryl here with us. She's not with us in the physical, but she's here in the, phys in the spiritual. And we're going to tell you why she's there today in a few moments. We have a picture of the Mona Lisa. And uh, we have uh, the world's Mona Lisa, and we have Pastor's Mona Lisa there together. And uh, you'll see, that's a, that's a picture of a trip that we're going to share about shortly in our message. Definition, Webster says that, pres that uh, preservation, preservation, we talk so much about perseverance, but we need to focus on preservation today, the cause of preservation. And this is why we're using the definition that Webster says. He says, the activity or the process of keeping something valued alive, intact, from, uh, free from damage or decay. I should have the game. Uh, Webster says that preservation is the activity or the process, whatever it takes to keep something valued alive, intact, or free from damage or decay. Therefore, the things in life that we have, we tend to prize, the things that we value, we tend to prize them, that is, we see them as special, we tend to protect them, we guard them with whatever means we can, and we also seek to preserve them. I want to ask you, do you have anything or anyone in your life that you consider valuable? Hmm? You may say, oh, my children are valuable. We have children that we value. We value our marriage. If you're married, we value our bank accounts. And those statements come in. We, we take a look at them. I know one pastor told me recently, he checks, his, he checks his CDs, his bank accounts every single week and to, to make sure that the money is still there. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad. And then there are other assets that we have. We have our homes. We have our automobiles, our jewelry, our clothing. We have so many things that we consider to be valuable that we want to uh, preserve. We want to keep. We want to guard. We want to secure. Uh, it was in September, on September 9th, 2009. September 9th on 2009. And my, my wife and I traveled to Paris, France. 
for our 30th wedding anniversary. Your time is clicking. When I started thinking about this, I said, Lord have mercy. Was it our 35th anniversary or was it our 30th anniversary? Uh, believe it or not, I was able to do the research and come up with this picture. This picture of Lady Cheryl there standing in front of Mona Lisa was taken on September 9th, on the very day of our 30th wedding anniversary. And I'm sure she's surprised because I, I told her, I was, I, was ask, I was asking her about the time, but she doesn't know that this was going to be presented. All right? Now, it was there that we got a view of Mona Lisa. As a little boy growing up, I heard the song by Nat King Cole, Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa. I didn't have a clue what Mona Lisa was or who she was. But we heard so many songs or written dramas, plays have been, have been uh, presented and created about this uh, Mona Lisa. Where well, you're looking at the Mona Lisa. It's the most famous painting in the world. It is housed at the, uh, let me get it cor pronounced correctly now, the Louvre, the Louvre, uh, those folks who are French descendants or French speaking would, would have the correct pronunciation, all right? The, the Louvre, Am I, I, do I have it right? Louvre? Okay, we call it Louvre then. Whatever makes you happy. And uh, it, it's, it's the place where the largest display of, of art, art, is located there in Paris, France. And uh, it was, this painting was created by, um, what's his name, Leonardo da Vinci, over 500 years ago over 500 years ago, and it still looks like this. And I remember they, they, they said if you go to Paris and you, and you go to the museum, make sure you go to see Mona Lisa. Uh, when I did my research, I discovered that over 10.5 million people go to France and visit this museum, and over 80% of the people who actually go make sure they see Mona Lisa annually, annually. Now, because of its, its, its great value, extensive measures are taken to preserve this piece of art. In fact, in 2021, it was insured, listen to this now, it was insured for $870 million. One piece of art. It's priceless because it's owned by the French government and no one is, no one is gonna buy it, no one can buy it. Where, where are they gonna keep it? And the government surely is not going to sell it at this point of time to anyone. Um, but because of its great, uh, its great value, great measures ha are taken or have been taken to protect it and to preserve it. The, it is encased in a, gla in a bulletproof glass case. If you get a chance to do some research, it was exciting and interesting to do the reading. Because people, they have some crazy people out there. People try to do all kinds of things. One, one man came and he threw a cup of, of, uh, of water, or not water, some kind of food on it once. Uh, a lady did something else to it again, and they encased it in a bulletproof glass case that is two inches thick. And it has in front of it a wooden platform that keeps people, the visitors from, who come to see it, from actually going to, to touch it and to try to handle it. And then when it comes to a preservation, the temperature in that case is kept at a, a constant 21 degrees centigrade, uh, 45 degrees Fahrenheit approximately, and uh, the humidity is 50%, all right? Relative humidity in the case is 50% to keep the material and the paints from uh, deterioration, from getting moisture and, and, and just falling apart. So great measures, great measures have been taken and are taken to keep this expensive and many other expensive paintings um, preserved, preserved. And also, 
uh, the lighting is regulated because you know light causes fading. So the lighting, when you go there, it's not bright. It's, it's kind of kind of dim and just right to keep the painting from, from uh, fading. Great measures are used to preserve this uh, great painting. And uh, no doubt, no doubt, the cost of its preservation is high. I did some research to find out if I can determine the cost of its preservation. But I could not determine the cost of preservation. But looking at the measures, the steps that are being used to preserve it, because there are always men starting, standing guard to protect this, this, this painting, a cost to preserve it. Two years, in our text, two years of seven, a seven-year famine have ravished Canaan. The, the famine has also affected Egypt, but word got to Jacob that there was food down there in Egypt. And as I was reading, I saw uh, Jacob telling his, 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 his 10 or 11 sons, he said, listen, what are you guys sitting around here looking at each other for? You know, there's food down in Egypt. Listen, when you have a need, don't sit around and fold your hands and wring your hands and wonder what to do. Get up. Jacob said, men, boys, get up. Go down. There's food down in Egypt. Let's go and get some food so that we won't starve. And so he sent them down there on two occasions. The second time that uh, they went, of course, they were tricked in, into coming back. But though, through a series of divine acts orchestrated by God himself, Joseph was miraculously elevated from being a farmer, a, ba a simple farmer in Canaan, to being the governor in the governor's mansion in Egypt. You know, you may be sitting here in church not knowing what tomorrow may hold. And when I say tomorrow, maybe you're not talking about tomorrow, tomorrow. It could happen in a year. It could happen in two years. It could happen in 10 years. You do not know where you are going to be sitting 10 years from now. Amen. All right? So Joseph was a, 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 a young man who uh, obeyed his father. He was sensitive to the things of God. God gave him some dreams. And through God's divine intervention, he ended up here in Egypt over the food and the, the possessions of uh, the Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, like I said, this is their second trip down in our text. But on seeing his brothers return to Egypt, on seeing his brothers return to Egypt, Joseph is unable to contain his composure. He's unable to control his emotions because he knows that these are the very men, these are my brothers who did these atrocious things to me. These are my brothers who put me in the pit and sold me into slavery. These are my very own brothers who did this to me, and now here they are. They didn't only come before him, but they bowed down before him in confirmation of the dream that he had had prior. And here in verse uh, 4, picking up the reading from verse 4 in our text, he says, I am your brother. He couldn't contain himself any longer. Early in the reading, uh, Joseph had, 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 had broken down and he ran out of the room and he went aside and he wept. He said, oh my God. He must have said, God, I can't believe that my brothers are back here with me. And here I am. I have all the power as it were in Egypt. As you promised. And Joseph says, I am your brother, verse 4, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with, with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save your lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping. In other words, no rain is going to fall on the earth, and there'll be no reason to plow, and there'll be nothing to reap. There's no, fo there's no food that's going to be coming forth. But verse 7, our text, but God sent me ahead of you. Hallelujah. God sent me ahead of you. Sometimes you do not know why you are where you are. Sometimes you do not know why you have certain experiences. Come on now. Sometimes you do not know why God brings certain people in your life or why God takes certain people out of your life. But listen, God 
is the one who knows the beginning and the end. He said, God sent me, hallelujah. God, as it were, paid the ticket, called the train, and sent me. He set it up. He sent me to preserve you. Hallelujah. hallelujah. To, preserve, uh, to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by your great deliverance. Hallelujah. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't our God awesome? This is why I've come to a stage in my life and ministry where I worry about nothing. I may look like I am insensitive. They may say you are indifferent, but I am not worrying about a thing. I have more time behind me at this point of life than I have in front of me. Listen, and I ain't taking no, no, no aspirin for anybody's headache because it's going to do you no good and it's going to do me no good. But we have a God. We have a God. And I thank God that he said to us early in the year that we shall overcome every situation that comes before us this year. Hallelujah. And we are seeing it happen. We are seeing it happen. And he says, listen, do not see things the way they are, but see things through my vision. See life through my perspective. I want to ask you a question. We heard, we've been hearing this, this, this saying over and over. Life is about 10% of what happens to you and 90% of what you do with what happens. I want to ask you, what does your 90% look like? As I was driving to church this morning, the Lord told me to ask you, what does your 90% of your, what does the 90% of your reactions, your responses look like to the 10% that has happened to you? That's the question. All right? So, if you did not know the history of Joseph, you will be tempted to think, after seeing him there, I'm sure he was attired in the, in the, in the governor's robe, and he was sitting on some, hot, some elevated throne, and, and he was looking down on the people. After all, Pharaoh told him, listen, there's no one in the land that would have more authority uh, than me, all right, that would have authority similar to mine, but you, all right? You will have control over all of the wealth of Egypt. You will have the last say over all the decisions that are made in my financial uh, administration. You will have control over all the wealth of Egypt. Some people might have said, might be tempted to say, oh, how convenient, how easy this was, this has turned out for the family of, of Joseph. Huh? It is like, almost like winning the lottery. One day you're impoverished, the next day you're rich. Some people might say it's like winning the lottery, and I'm not advocating that you go and buy lottery tickets. Because I haven't met anyone yet who has won the lottery. I would love to meet a lottery winner, not to get any money from, the, from them or to get anything from them, but I would love to meet a lottery winner. But I haven't met any yet, so I'm trying to encourage you, don't waste your time trying to win the lottery when you have a God who controls all of the wealth. You have access to a God who controls all of the wealth that is in the world. But it costs much, it costs much for Joseph to be where he is. And this is what the Lord put into my spirit when this text jumped off at me. It costed Joseph much more than his own brothers knew. God designed a plan to preserve his people. It costed much. When people see you looking, when people see you looking good, looking sharp, dressing nice, look, driving a nice car, living in a nice home, and so forth, they must wonder sometimes how in the world is he doing it? How did she do it? What shortcuts did they make? But they don't wonder. They, they wonder sometimes how did you do it? How did she get that cushiony job? How did he get that cushiony job? Not knowing the sacrifices that you made to get to where you are or to, to, to be in a place where you have been able to preserve a few things in life. They see you in a secure career, not knowing the long hours that you've put in in study. 
Come on now. And the discipline it took to complete your studies. Your marriage and your family is still intact. People give you your marriage a couple of months, a couple of years, but you have stood the test. You have stood in the, in, in, in the fight, so to speak. You have continued to be patient. You've continued to be kind. You've continued to be loving. People want to know, why is it that your marriage haven't fallen apart as yet? They don't realize the price that you have paid. They don't realize the, the, the endurance that you have gone to keep your very sanity. Hmm? To keep your home together. Your children are coming home at night. They're not on drugs. They're not hanging out in the clubs. They're not sleeping around. They're not in gangs. But they do not know how you have been praying for your children. They do not know how you have been pulling your children aside and counseling them and advising them and showing them examples of the wrong way to go and pointing them in the right direction. They did not see when you were staying up reading the Bible to your children. They did not see when you called your children together to have family devotions. When you encourage your children to pray for themselves and pray for others. They want to know why is it that your children, your house is intact. They don't see the cost. The price that you paid to keep your family together, your children together, your marriage together, your home together. You have kept your job when others have been laid off. You have kept your job. You have been promoted when others have been sent home. But you know what? They didn't see when you were putting in the extra hours. They didn't see when you were checking the clock in the morning to make sure you got to work on time. They didn't see when, they didn't see when you were uh, ab abstaining from going on long vacations and taking shorter vacations and putting in the extra sacrifices on the job. But the boss was watching. And this is why you're still in the job. This is why you got the promotion. Sometimes you're not even qualified for the position, but you got it nevertheless. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. you were not showing up late. You were not calling in sick. You were not hiding and shirking from the work when it was put before uh, uh, the, the workers. You preserved, you paid the price. Joseph reached this position through sacrifice. Joseph reached this position of governorship through his integrity. Joseph reached this position through being diligent and also Joseph reached this position through being obedient to God. I say that again. He reached this level in Egypt through sacrifice, through integrity, through diligence, and through obedience to God. You listening? It costed him much to be able to at this time say, God sent me here to preserve you preservation costs and this is what we're here to talk about today the cost of preservation the cost of preservation verse 7 tells us uh, that but God sent me ahead of you to preserve me to preserve you but while he was using me and preparing me to preserve you uh, he was preparing me for the task I want to let you know today, God is preparing you for the task that he has ahead of you. It may seem difficult today. It may seem impossible. Sometimes you want to pull the hair out of your head. I was sharing with Reverend Sandra this morning that I love the book of Exodus. You know why I love the book of Exodus, I told her? Because I discovered like Moses that in God's house you have some hard-headed people. Amen. No offense to anyone. Not, in, not, not a destiny. We don't have any hard-headed people at Destiny. But it consoles me because I know I saw what Moses went through. And sometimes you want to say, well, I, 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 I've had it with this thing. But God is preparing us and has prepared us for something greater. Joseph is too humble to get into the details of how much it costed him to preserve his family. He was happy to see his brothers. He was seeing the big picture that they had never saw. 
and he did not bother to itemize the things that he paid, the experiences that he went through to be where he was. But I want to take some time to let us know the cost that Joseph paid to be where he is today or where he was at that time. He lived with a bunch of brothers who were jealous of him. Jealous of him because of his father's favor upon him. Listen, people don't like you sometimes for no reason. But there are other times when people like you, you can't tell why they like you. And they just show favor to you. That's the other side of the script. Have you ever been favored? When you felt like you shouldn't, be, shouldn't have been favored? Well, listen, we got some favor there in Barbados the other day that we were amazed. We were in a line, a queue, in a government queue, waiting to get some paperwork done. And they had a whole tent filled with people out there sitting and waiting. And Lady Cheryl, of course, she wasn't feeling 100%. The rain was pouring. The rain was just pouring. And it was late in the evening. And she went in to get the, the paperwork done. And it was God's intervention. As I was sitting waiting, they called me. And both of us went past all of the people sitting under the tent. And we got everything done in the while the rain was pouring at the last moments of the day. God has a way of giving his people favor. And we just looked at each other and we said, this is God causes us to overcome once again. God is at work once again. Hallelujah. Joseph had brothers who were jealous of him. He was hated for no cause. Listen. He was discredited and mocked because of the prophetic dreams that he had. His father made him a beautiful robe. We all know the story of Joseph and the, and the beautiful robe that he had. His brothers stole that robe. This, I, I think of this, that robe like this, 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 this beautiful shirt that this young man is wearing right here. Stand a minute, brother. Yeah, you stand, stand a minute. Yeah, yeah. I, I think of that robe like this shirt. A multicolor, you can sit now, thank you. A multicolor, beautiful shirt, but it was probably striped instead of being crossed like that, all right? He was robbed of his beautiful robe. He was thrown into a well by his own brothers. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. They, they, they lied and said that a ferocious animal, they told his own father, a ferocious animal ate that son that you love so much. They lied on him. And uh, they, they, he was sold into to Potiphar like a mere, like mere poverty. And then uh, sexually, he was sexually harassed by his boss's wife. All right? And then when she didn't get her, her way with him, she accused him now of molesting her and attempted rape and had him thrown into the pit, into the dungeon, sent to prison for a crime that he never even thought of doing. Can you imagine? Not that he didn't commit the crime. He never even, it never even came to his mind to, to commit these acts with this woman. And, and spent time in jail. And then on top of that all, he met this cupbearer and this baker. And he interpreted their, dream, their dreams. And the dreams came to pass. And he told, he told the cupbearer, don't forget me now. Don't forget me when you get out there. And he was forgotten forgotten two years went by and he made no mention have you ever done good for people and you expect to get a little assistance to get a little help to get a little hand up somewhere and you can't find them when you need them that never happened to you it only happened to pastor no one knew the suffering no one knows the suffering like you do they don't know how you paid listen half of the light bill in order to pay the gas bill. Come on now. To preserve the telephone, they don't know how you paid half of the, the gas bill to have something left over to keep the telephones on. They don't know the times when you wore pass, pass, you wore pass down shoes. I, I, had two, I have two older brothers, so I know what it is. You folks who came from the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the island, you know what I'm talking about. You have elder siblings, whether you're a girl or boy, and you have older brothers, and you find yourself getting these pass-me-down shoes. But you know what? The pass-me-down shoes always look better and wore better than the ones you had before. Because your parents never gave you something that was older or looking uh, more torn and, rad and, and razzy than, than uh, the one you had. You know what I'm talking about. Hmm? 
And I tell you, you know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about when they talk about your car, you're driving your car. I remember when I first, the first car I had in this country was $50. Who can imagine buying a $50 car? Big car, four wheels. It was white. <laughs> Ford Galaxy, big Ford Galaxy, first car. And I never forget, I was working in a shop there in um, Glenwood Road, and, and the boss that I had, uh, one of the guys that I did a job for, he liked the job so much, he gave me four brand new tires for the car. And the boss that I had stole the, the four tires from me because I had nowhere to keep the, to keep the, the, the wheels. He stole the tires. Never forget that. I forgot about it, but now I'm, I'm sharing this with you now because I just remembered it. These are the things that we go through. That $50 car broke down in every corner in Brooklyn. Whether it's Utica and Church, Church and Prospect, Prospect and, and Buffalo, it broke down on every corner of Brooklyn. Who, who's ever had a car like that? You had a car, but you can remember every corner that it broke down on. You don't know the price. You don't know the price that was paid. You don't know when the, you, you know when the muffler started making noise. <laughs> And, and, and then after the muffler starts making noise, it starts to drag on the ground, <laughs> and, the, and the fire is flashing on the ground. And then you have to go in there with a, with, a, with, a, with a hanger or some piece of wire and try to, it never happened to you. That never happened to you, never happened to you. Never happened to you. Listen, let's bring this, let us bring this cost home now. Let's bring this cost home. They pass this building here, this building, 536 South Franklin Street. And they see it looking good today, all right? But they don't know the cost and the sacrifices that got us to where we are today to preserve this building. You may not know, this building was closed up for over two years. Nothing was going on here. No one was in it. I was looking to see if I see Sister Long John, but I don't see her. <laughs> she would be able to testify because she was a member here at this church. All you had was cobwebs, flaking paint, and a moldy, musty scent in, in a dark building, in a dark building. The ceiling was never painted. It only went, the paint only went as far as halfway of the building. You see that line going across there. They never took the time to go any higher than that. So it had a, a greenish gray color up there. But the Lord gave us a vision. The Lord gave us a vision. They don't know when we were loading up equipment on Sunday mornings there at the VFW Post in Rosedale, loading up equipment and unpacking it there and packing it back up in the winter, in the cold, in the snow, in the rain. Come on now, in the heat. They don't know what we went through for five straight years there at, uh, in Rosedale. When we moved from the VFW post to QCC, the old QCC, now the house, they said it was a foolish uh, purchase to make. One contractor said to me, you bought this building? I said, yeah, we bought this building. We bought it for church. He said, that was a foolish buy you made there. That building, remember the lady who owned the building, it was an older lady, uh, probably Italian, and she passed away. And the son, we wanted to just get rid of the property. And he was in contract before us. And for some reason, he didn't get the money, he couldn't get the money, and he came back to us, similar to this situation here. And he said, you're so interested in this, in this building? I said, yeah, we just wanted to get a place to go and worship. What I didn't know is that that property was in a flood zone. Listen, we went in there and we, the Lord blessed us through Home Depot, thank you. Blessed us with some equipment, some materials and whatnot. And we got, we fixed the building up and then Sandy came. Sandy came and flooded the basement of that building. The water was up this high. The water was pouring through the windows of the basement. And our brand new boiler that we put in there, our brand new hot water tank that we put in there was lost. They were lost. People don't know where you came from when they see you where you are. We had to spend the money and replace those items as well as fix the whole place up. One contractor said to me back then, he said, you, you, you wasted your money, man. I would never buy this building. We paid $150,000 for 
for that property in 2001. You listening? And when we sold it, it was sold for over $500,000. You listening? I want to I wanna inform you today. I want to educate you today. I want to challenge you today not to see things as they are, but see things as they can be with God's help. Hallelujah. See things with the eyes of God, through the eyes of God. We know, it was a, we know it was a flood zone, but we didn't know the extent of the cost that we would have to put into it after the flood came. And then we came here to this building, and uh, like I said, it was not used for two years, and it, it, it looked like an impossible task. Uh, I don't know if the sister is watching us today. She, she may be watching us because I remember she stood right there in the corner where Deacon Winston is sitting, and she said, she said pa -pa Pastor, this is a lot of work. And she was right. But she was seeing it from the natural eyes only. We have to see it from the finished line. Brother Aaron, I was sitting there a few moments ago, and I looked up here. And I thought of the work that you did last year. What was last year? When you came and painted this building practically all, almost by yourself with the help of the deacons came and, 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 and watched you work 40 months. Fantastic job you did last year. Fantastic job. Fantastic job. Listen, we did not know when we came here, we did not have windows, glass windows. We had to replace the glass window. All the glass had to be replaced. We had bullet holes. I don't know, I don't know what was happening over here back then. All those windows down there in Jubilee Hall, bullet holes, smashed in, damaged, broken. Then they, they tried to paste over the holes with plastic paper. They did all kinds of stuff with the glass. And, we had to replace all of the glass eventually. We had to replace the roof that was leaking, all right? We, we, we had to replace the bathrooms. We built the bathrooms. They were all rotted and dilapidated. The floors were no good. The kitchen had to be replaced. Inside and outside the building needed to be painted. We never had a decent sound system in this place. This platform wasn't here. One of these days we'll show. This is why we take pictures, because we can look back and see where we came from. I can show you the pictures of what this building looked like when we came in here. We didn't have any sound system. We didn't have any video system. Listen, we didn't have any air conditioning. When you come in here in the summertime and it feels a little warm, we click the air conditions on. Listen, we didn't have any heat in the building either. None at all. We didn't have any heat. But God. But God. But God. Hallelujah. But God. And when we came here that summer, the grass began to grow. Because you know you can't stop grass from growing. And we didn't have contact with any gardener or any means of cutting. You remember the trees. There were trees. All around here were trees. We cut down about 17, 18 large trees from off this property, especially from along here. To the, to the neighbors said, Pastor, we thank you for cutting those trees down. Because when it got windy, we were afraid that the trees would fall in our houses over here. And we cut all those trees down. Listen, people don't know. People don't know. So when the grass started growing and we were fixing the building, someone came with their car, took their lawnmower and put it in the trunk of their car and took the lawnmower out and spent four hours cutting this grass. I wouldn't tell you who the person was. And it went on for months. You don't know where we came from. It is good to know where we came from because we can appreciate better where we are today. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when the snow started to fall, we didn't have this little sidewalk. Deacon Winston used to come for the most part back at QCC and he would maintain the, the snow and then we would help him when we, kept, when we could. But when the snow started to fall, we had snow all along the oh, four, the, the, the three sides of the street to clean, but these two sides mainly. But you know who came and cleaned it up? Faithful men. Dedicated women came and shoveled the snow in the early days until we got ourselves organized. We didn't have a sprinkler system in this building. But the Lord showed us if we're going to maintain this property in pristine condition, we needed to have a sprinkler system. And we installed a sprinkler system. Listen, there is a cost for preservation. 
There's a cost to, pres to preservation. But wherever the Lord sends you, he will prepare for you and he will supply your needs. Hallelujah. Joseph was in the pit, but God made a way out for him. He was falsely accused, but God was his attorney. Hallelujah. God was his attorney. God represented him. He was in the prison, and God stood in the prison with him. Hallelujah. And he got into the, prison, the, the, the palace, and God still stood with him there as well. In closing, when Joseph told his brothers, God sent me here ahead of you to preserve a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. He was not just speaking about the immediate sustenance or preservation. He wasn't just speaking about the immediate survival of his family and the people in Egypt and Canaan. He was seen way beyond his brothers. You see, God had given Joseph a, the, the eyes of a visionary. God had given him dreams concerning the future events. And when Joseph said, listen, don't, 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 don't be angry with yourself. Don't be upset with yourself. God was at work for the long haul of the future. He was seen way beyond his brothers in Canaan and in Egypt. Joseph was seen that through the lineage now of Joseph, uh, of Jacob, sorry. Jacob's name was changed to what? Israel. And Joseph was seeing that through the lineage of Israel, his father, according to the prophet Isaiah, hallelujah, preservation of the world was coming. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You want to talk about preservation? Joseph was seeing prophetically that all humanity was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Hallelujah. And that the wages of sin is death, but that he would preserve a people unto himself. He would call us a call of people unto himself for salvation through his son Jesus Christ. Joseph was looking way beyond his brothers. He saw that through his father's lineage, hallelujah, that the lion of the tribe of Judah, you heard the name? The lion of the tribe of Judah would come. Oh, glory to God. I don't know if you're getting this today. The lion of the tribe of Judah will come and he will pay the ultimate price, hallelujah, to preserve you and I, to wash us and cleanse us from our sins. So that thou, that, that favorite uh, text in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall have preservation, hallelujah, shall be preserved for eternity. Isaiah declared, but he was wounded. Listen to the cost. Listen to the price. Isaiah said, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The cost was great. We were all marked for death. You and I were marked for death because of Adam's sin. Before you committed any sins against God, because you, before, you, before you broke any of God's laws, you were marked for death because we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But Romans 12 and 5 lets us know, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. We were marked for death because of our inheritance, of a sinful nature, a nature that leads to death. But the text doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. Romans, 50, Romans 12 says, but the gift is not like the, tre the trespass. 
For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and gift that came by the grace of his one son, his, well, the one man, Christ Jesus, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigns through that one man, how much more with those who receive God's abundant grace. Hallelujah. Provision of grace and the gift of the righteous reign in life through the one man. Listen, if we would receive, hallelujah, if we would receive, the gift is available, but you have to receive it. God, through Jesus Christ, paid the ultimate cost, paid the ultimate price to preserve you and me. Think of yourself without Christ today. Think of yourself without Jesus Christ today. Think of your life as a lost sinner today. Think about your life and Christ have, have not died on the cross. Think of all the animals, the bulls and the goats. Ever so often the excavators are digging up in, the, in, the, uh, in, in South America and different parts of the world. All of these places where sacrifices have been offered. Thousands and thousands of bulls and goats have been offered. We would still be living under the sacrificial system. Hallelujah. But thank God we don't have to slay the lamb anymore. The lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. Listen, God through Jesus Christ paid the ultimate cost to preserve you and I eternally. And you will receive abundance, an abundance of provision through the grace of God. It is available today. For those of you who have already received the abundance of God's grace. I want to ask you, are you really treasuring this abundance of grace? Do we really treasure our salvation the way we should? Do we really value the work that Christ did on the cross? As I sat this morning, I meditated, Lord, help me to really appreciate what you did on Calvary. You left the portals of heaven. You, you, you were the one who spoke to the sun and the moon and, and called them into existence. You were the one who separated the, the waters from the earth. You were the one who caused the birds to be created. You were the one who breathed breath into humanity. And you came and you died in my place. Lord, forgive me for less counting your, your wonderful, the wonderful price that you pay, paid to preserve me. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord today. Jesus paid a, a great price. He paid the ultimate price to preserve, to, to preserve us. Hallelujah. Yes, G Joseph went through a lot of experiences. He had a lot of difficult experiences in life. He experienced things that none of us would want to encounter. Who would ever want to be put in a pit by their own brothers? Who would want to be slowly sold into slavery? by their own blood brother. Who would want to be lied upon, accused of attempted rape or sexual abuse that you never did? He, he, he experienced a lot. He paid a great price to get to where he was. But listen, Jesus paid it all, the song says. All to him we owe today. Do we really value Christ sacrifice the way we should. When time is no more and we are in glory worshiping with the angels, worshiping with the other saints, singing as Isaiah declared, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. Holy, holy, holy. The Bible lets us know that the saints are going to be worshiping him. Listen, we wouldn't have to go to work. We wouldn't have to shovel snow. We wouldn't have to wash clothing. We wouldn't have to cook food. We wouldn't have to do anything. But all we would have a desire to do is to, to worship God. Lift our hands up and, and bow before him in worship and pray. When, when time is no more, we are worshiping God in eternity. We have been preserved for eternity. Remember the cost. The cost that was paid through Jesus Christ's death 
on Calvary. And this is why today we are going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper, Supper at this time. I, I pray today that, that as we get a glimpse of Calvary, as we see what Jesus did, listen, the Bible says that he was wounded, he suffered, he bled and died. They spat upon him. They called him names. They slapped him in the face. Eventually, they nailed him to the cross. And his life's blood poured out for you and for me. That's, that was the price, the ultimate price. If you're here today, you have never, or you're listening to me by YouTube, you have never appreciated the cost of Jesus' sacrifice by inviting him into your life, by making him Lord of your life. I can't think of a better time to do so than right now. Nothing else has to be done. The final sacrifice has been paid. Is there one person who will say, yes, pastor, pray for me. I, I, need, I need to receive Christ today. I need him. Because see, I see what he did for me in the cross. I appreciate it. And I want to receive him as my savior. Or if you're here now and you, I take it then that you're all saved, you're all born again. But you have got a better glimpse of the cost that Christ paid to preserve you, to purchase your salvation. I want you to stand right to your feet right where you are. You have a new appreciation for the cost. Let's give Jesus a clap off. Minister Jackie needed to get out of his system. <laughs> Aren't you glad that Jesus always finishes what he starts? He never leaves anything undone, half done, partially completed. That's why he said on the cross, it is to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, hallelujah, without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. And everyone says, God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Hallelujah. The price has been paid for your preservation. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah.